like to welcome all of you to the Is Christianity Natural Conference, Evolutionary <coughs> and Cognitive Science Perspectives. Um, I want to briefly introduce the project to you. It's a joint project of um, the Murdoch Charitable Trust, which is the funding agency, the Calvin College uh, Seminars in Christian Scholarship, which is a program uh, that I helped develop along with uh, Joel Carpenter, who was at that time at the Pew Charitable Trust. Joel's right here. Uh, many years ago, as ways to gather uh, groups of scholars together, of Christian scholars who would work on particular topics and in particular fields. Um, and so this is uh, one of a long series, multiple years of similar seminars. This one in particular is a three-year project. Uh, it began as a gathering of um, uh, Justin Barrett, who was the director in the gathering of early career scholars, uh, mostly from the social sciences, but some philosophers and theologians, uh, interested in looking particularly at the field of cognitive science and Christianity. Uh, turns out cognitive science of religion and Christianity. Turns out that cognitive science of religion hadn't dealt much with Christianity at all, so it's an attempt to move in that direction. Um, so that's the sort of background. Uh, tonight is the first plenary lecture, um, and then uh, after, uh, the, during the sessions tomorrow, we'll have a full slate of papers by the members of the seminar participants, uh, and then we'll uh, have another plenary lecture again uh, tomorrow evening. So we certainly invite everyone uh, to participate in those events with us tomorrow as well. So I think I'll go ahead and begin by introducing tonight's speakers. Um, the keynote speaker is um, uh, Robert McCauley. Uh, he's the um, William Rand Keenan Jr. University Professor of Philosophy and the Director of the Center for Mind and Culture at Emory University, and he's been there 30 plus years, I believe. A native Pittsburghian, but he now makes Atlanta his home. Um, and then responding tonight is Justin Barrett, uh, previously of Oxford University, now the Thrive Professor of Developmental Science and Director of the Thrive Center for Human uh, Development at Fuller Seminary. So, with no further ado, I'd like to welcome up here um, Dr. McCauley. So, pleased to have, have you with us. Good to be a second. Thanks, Mike, for that kind introduction, uh, and thanks for the invitation. Uh, it is a pleasure to be back in Seattle. I, it's been, uh, I'm afraid, a number of years since I've been here, but every time I come to this city, I always have the same reaction, and that is, I mean, it's just wondrous. I think it's one of the most wonderful, beautiful places I've ever been in the world. Uh, the plane, you know, came in right beside Mount Rainier, and you know, you're kind of out. <laughs> Uh, I like being here. <laughs> um, but that said, I should get to business. Uh, um, there is, of course, a uh, huge religion and science comparison industry out there. Oh, I guess I'm supposed to turn this on. I think I probably am not desperate for this microphone, but I'm speaking at the functional, well, the, not the functional equivalent, the real equivalent of 10 o'clock at night for me. Um, so I'm afraid my voice and stamina may be stretched if I just do it without the mic. So I'm going to use the mic, and I hope I don't blast you out of the place. Um, as I was saying, there, there, there's a long-standing sort of religion and science comparison industry that's been out there for uh, uh, at least 150 years. Um, the talk I'm going to be giving tonight is, is uh, not a sort of normal uh, fit in that uh, uh, industry, which is to say that uh, I'm not going to be interested in uh, sort of, or not at least principally interested in metaphysics or epistemology or theology. Um, rather, what I'm going to be looking at is questions about cognition, cognition and culture, but principally cognition. Uh, moreover, I want to make clear from the outset 
that nothing I'm proposing is intended to be comprehensive. That is to say, I'm not telling the whole story about religion. I'm not telling the whole story about science. I'm not even telling the whole story about religious cognition or scientific cognition. Um, this is just, as it were, uh, some ideas that I hope give us a little bit of leverage to help us make progress with each of them. Um, OK, that said, uh, now I changed that slide. Why did it come up that way? OK. Um, there are four parts to this talk uh, because I found out that I was I, I found out that I was going to have more a little more time than I thought I was, uh, but don't worry too much about that final one because uh, we'll see how time goes. But uh, um, in short, what I'm going to do is spend some time talking to you about cognition. Um, then what I'll do is take some of the morals of what I have to say about cognition and apply them to thinking about science, such that I'll describe it as you can see as an unna cognitively unnatural activity that humans engage in. Um, then what I'll do in the third section is talk about what I'll call the cognitive naturalness of religion. Now, I guess I understand that with most of the members of this audience, though not all of the members of this audience, there's some familiarity with this view. Um, so um, I'll try not to belabor it. And I apologize if I'm just going over things you are already very familiar with. Uh, if time allows, we'll go on to that fourth section that the famous invisible fourth section, OK? Um, in which uh, what I'll talk about very, very briefly, it's actually just a single slide, but it's uh, some, looking at some unexpected consequences of carrying out this kind of comparison of, of uh, science and religion. Um, in each case, what I will do also in talking, certainly in the second and third parts about science and religion in each case, I'll, I will talk about both cognitive products and cognitive processes. OK? All right, a little bit about cognition first. Uh, oh, no, there, <laughs> there it is. I know what happened. OK, there, there. see, it is unexpected. I told you. Uh, OK, uh, let's talk a little bit about cognition. All right. Um, actually, out there in the world of cognitive psychology, for well over 40 years, there has been a distinction um, uh, made uh, that is captured under the rubric uh, dual processing theories. Um, at one level, this is, this is fairly straightforward. Uh, there's been a huge literature, and there's all sorts of things to say about this, and there's some controversy that surrounds some of it. But I think it's fair to say that it has prevailed. Um, that's a distinction between broadly what I'll call reflective as opposed to intuitive. I mean, there's lots of terms that are used, but these are as good as any. Um, in short, each carries, as it were, um, um, a sort of constellation of properties that contrast with one another. Um, and probably the one to start with is simply conscious and unconscious. Uh, I think it's fair to say that uh, at least most of our, uh, what we take to be our reflection seems to rise to the level of consciousness. Um, we carry out reflection often consciously. Uh, that conscious Reflection itself has uh, got some of these foundations, I think, is also true, if you want to know the honest truth. But um, mostly the intuitive stuff is, is unconscious. Um, this is stuff that human minds do um, that sort of just pop into consciousness. Um, um, our implicit uh, conceptions, uh, in contrast over there, in contrast to our sort of consciously held beliefs and theories. Um, um, the uh, intuitions range across a huge number of domains, but actually, let me not, let me not do that right now. Okay, conscious uh, reflection is, uh, tends to be deliberate. Uh, it's slow. It's overwhelmingly linguistic as we experience it. Most of us spend most of the time, whenever we think much about our thinking, we find that we're thinking in language, uh, typically our native language. Okay. Uh, um, the fact of the matter is most of the intuitive stuff, although it's something about which we have a, a remarkable command, it's not typically stuff that we find very easy to put into language. Um, oddly enough, one of the best examples of this is language. It's really my favorite example, OK? Um, if I now say to you, uh, and I'm quoting, by the way, curious green ideas sleep furiously, 
Um, I assume I've got a room full of native English speakers, and uh, you know, every native English speaker is going to know there's something wrong with that utterance I've just made. It's a little different from the utterance, uh, green ideas, uh, sleep, uh, curious, furiously. Uh, that's got problems as well, but it's got different problems, and, and we're aware of that. Now note, any native English speaker is going to note that straight away. It's again, one of these intuitions, and you can already see what I'm saying here, fast and automatic and so on, okay? These things come automatically. But when you ask people to articulate the principles that inform these intuitions, the fact of the matter is, we're mostly at sea. We have no idea. Uh, well, I know it doesn't sound right, but uh, you know, we kind of then actually what we'll start doing is hearkening back to our sort of grammar uh, from eighth grade when we had to diagram sentences, at least if you had a good education. Okay. Um, all right. Um, what I'm going to overwhelmingly focus on is the intuitive stuff. That's what I want to spend some time talking about. Okay. Now, let me set this same distinction up and let it look a little differently. Um, again, what I want to talk about is the intuitive stuff. And I'm going to call that stuff partly as a matter of convenience for the purpose of making some contrasts uh, particularly striking, I hope. Uh, to call that stuff cognitively natural. And there is a sense in which it feels cognitively natural. Something that, as it were, sort of comes automatically and fast to you in contrast to stuff that you have to work really hard to figure out. Um, if you're going to call either of those natural, it would seem to be the former category. OK. Um, I have in mind, I'll read a little bit here, specific beliefs or actions that arise automatically and instantaneously and are held or done without reflection. Uh, I should add that we presume that the knowledge we get from these kinds of uh, systems, we just presume are sound, though in fact they're radically underdetermined by the evidence. Um, this includes both knowing how and knowing that. Uh, knowing how to adjust your gait as you walk across an uneven terrain. Uh, this is stuff that human beings, in most circumstances, just do automatically. You don't sit and consciously worry about these, each footstep. You just move your way across a, a field. Um, but likewise, uh, knowing that. You know, if the telephone rings uh, uh, at dinner time, uh, uh, the inference that you draw, and you tend to draw it automatically, is <laughs> somebody wants to sell me something, right? Um, that's why they're calling at dinner time. At least that's who calls our house at dinner time. Um, now, actually, I would like to focus uh, for a moment on that sort of second case because it helps me to draw a contrast that I want to draw. Um, uh, probably as good as any. Uh, illustration of sort of contemporary discussion of these ideas is in uh, Daniel Kahneman's new bestseller. Uh, alas, I'm discussing this stuff too. Mine isn't a bestseller yet, but uh, uh, that's his book, Thinking Fast and Slow. Okay. Uh, the fact of the matter is, is that what I'm going to be trying to suggest to you is, is that, um, that with regard to that thinking fast, there's a further distinction that deserves to be made. And it actually, so far as I know, isn't much isn't made very often or very clearly in most of the psychological literature, somewhat to my surprise. And that's a distinction, yeah, that's what I'm going to focus on, OK, between what I'm going to call practiced naturalness in contrast to maturational naturalness, OK? And always the red gives you the clue about where I'm going, OK? What I'm interested in is the maturational naturalness. Um, what is practiced naturalness? Uh, Practice, practice naturalness is, in effect, expertise. I don't mean anything esoteric by that. Uh, we're all, everyone in this room is an expert in all sorts of things. Um, I mean, one of my illustrations, since I do give talks around various places, right, is to just use the public transportation system in any given city. Uh, those of you who are from Seattle know the public transportation system, at least some of you do. And the people who use it regularly know it cold. But any newcomer knows that when you go, for example, to the train or to the buses, I mean, you know, you're puzzling. Now, how is it that they you have to put an exact change? Uh, do you have to get the thing uh, validated? Uh, you know, on and on and on. Now, you can learn it pretty quickly. It's not too tough in any city that I've been in anyway. But, but it takes a little while, right? You don't have practice naturalists. You have, you're brand new. But all the people, I mean, so there's millions, literally, in some cities that, as it were, are experts on something like this, OK? And think back about that, that list of, of characteristics. Fast, automatic, 
Okay, off, uh, sorry, online, uh, not verbal, uh, which is to say that when you go up and ask them how you do it, right, they'll start to tell you, and if they're not right there where the machines are, inevitably they will forget something. Uh, there'll be some little variable in the thing that they've forgotten. Why? Because it's automatic. It's so automatic, they don't even realize there's certain things they've forgotten because it's so automatic, okay? Um, this yields a kind of oxymoronic notion of what I'm calling practiced naturalness. So naturalness can, can be acquired in certain areas, as it were. Um, this is what, indeed, we have a standard English idiom for, right? We say that certain things eventually become second nature. But that's what I'm mostly not going to be interested in. What I want to talk about is what is first nature. That is to say, um, these maturationally natural intuitions and conceptions that human beings seem to possess. OK, yeah, that's, that, those are the ones, right? All right. Um, now, to the extent that this has been discussed out there, these kinds of issues have been discussed. I mean, in the standard literatures, there's a great deal of focus and discussion about what are uh, called uh, um, you know, the mod what is called the modularity of mind. Uh, uh, claims about uh, nativism, uh, innate modules, and so on. Uh, I mean, most famously, all the way back into the 1950s, Noam Chomsky uh, argued that, that human beings have, as it were, an innate module for language acquisition. We have what he called LAD, a language acquisition device. Okay, that's why it turns out that Little kids can learn language, even though it's so incredibly complicated. But they don't learn physics. It's, it's, it's incredibly complicated, too. But they don't learn that. Uh, OK? All right, what kinds of criteria pick this out? Well, first of all, most of these systems appear pretty early. Uh, most of them are up and running by school age. And a comment about this, this is why school age turns out to be just about the same age across all cultures. Um, I mean, there's a little bit of variability, but not much. And actually, the, there's actual empirical research that shows with many of the systems I'm talking about, there's very little variability. In fact, it's astonishing how little variability there is in terms of the acquisition and command of some of these systems. Um, interestingly, um, these systems are up and running before human beings realize that they're up and running. Uh, everyone in this room remembers when they learned to ride a bike. No one in this room remembers when they learned to walk. Uh, everyone in this room remembers when they learned to read and write. No one in this room remembers when they learned to talk. Uh, there is a contrast between practiced as opposed to maturational natural, naturalness. Okay? Um, okay. These systems address basic problems. Um, by that, I mean problems concerned with, typically concerned with human survival. Uh, I mean things like the perceptual recognition of faces, uh, the cognitive discrimination of syntactic distinctions, uh, and action responses in, in response to environmental contaminants. Uh, I mean, three rather different domains, but all of them I would count as maturationally natural. Um, these systems and their, their appearance virtually define normal development. Uh, I'm sure I've got a number of parents in the room. Uh, uh, if your child doesn't sort of show these things on the sort of pretty, pretty standard developmental schedule, you get concerned and you take your kid to the doctor. Uh, my daughter literally did this with my second granddaughter uh, because at 14 months she still wasn't crawling. And my daughter's like, she ought to be crawling by now. What's going on? You know, so she took her to the doctor. It turns out there's a fair amount. You know, I mean, it's a bell curve. There's some, you know, there's some outliers at each end, right? Um, she's crawling now, she's walking, she's talking. It's, it's all cool. Okay. Um, they do not depend on any culturally distinctive support. That is to say, the acquisition of these systems doesn't turn on instruction. You don't instruct your kid how to walk. You don't instruct your kid how to talk. You just talk around them and walk around them. And then they start doing stuff that's like that. And then eventually, they're doing it themselves. Um, it doesn't require schooling or artifacts or specially prepared environments, though we do prepare environments at times. I should add that there is actually some research uh, coming out of Karen Adolph's lab, lab at NYU that shows that um, when parents, as it were, try to aid their kids in walking, they actually uh, hinder them. Uh, that it's, in fact, the attempts to instruct end up getting in the way. They don't help a bit. 
Okay? These systems, I would argue, constitute domain-specific systems at the end. And by the end, I mean by the end of their development, if there is at least a kind of mature state. I don't know that any of these systems has an absolute end, but, but a mature state of development. Uh, if not at the beginning, and I really want to hedge about the beginning. Uh, I'm not a, a, a sort of a, a rabid nativist, and I'm not even a rabid modularist. Um, but it seems to me that how, whatever the origins of these systems are, about which people argue and have been arguing for 40, 50 years now, um, that by the time these systems are sort of up and running, uh, it looks pretty clearly like they're, are, they're domain specific. Uh, I've mentioned already things like faces, language, dealing with contaminants, and so on. And I'll give you some more illustrations in just a second. Um, they engage when triggered by distinctive cues. Uh, a few diagnostic cues are enough. Uh, the way I said it in uh, a class I'm teaching at Emory, actually just this, uh, just Thursday, yesterday. Yes, I was teaching at Emory yesterday morning. Yeah. Okay. Um, you know, these systems are really stupid systems. Um, the fact that a few diagnostic cues is enough to get them rolling means that we are susceptible to illusions. Because if you can find a system that mimics the cues that get these things rolling, that's enough for them to fire. My favorite illustration, because I, t I take it everyone in the room will understand this one instantly, is simply the modern invention of movies. When you are sitting in a movie theater, you see a whole world filled with people doing things, climbing mountains, talking to each other, having social relations of a variety of sorts, driving cars, doing all kinds of stuff. You want to dispel all that instantly? Just walk down to the side of the screen and look across the screen. And then what you'll realize is all you're seeing is a bunch of light flickering on a, on a surface. Right? But we're off and running if we get cued the right way. OK. Some examples. I've mentioned language. Um, also, the basic physics of solid objects. Uh, research by Rene Bayerjean uh, at Illinois, uh, Liz Spelke at Harvard, and a variety of their colleagues shows that it turns out that, that babies know some things about the physical universe. Um, it's interesting what they do know, and it's interesting what they don't know. Uh, famously, uh, they do know that two objects cannot occupy the same space at the same time. Um, I mean, this is a remarkable accomplishment by developmental psychologists. I know I've got a few in the audience, but I want to praise your discipline. Because this is not a trivial matter. How is it that you just ascertain what it is that a baby knows when the baby can't tell you what it knows? And of course, the, the designs of these experiments are just brilliant. Um, and so we're able to, indeed, if you want to talk about the designs, we can afterward. Um, as I said, there's lots of evidence. They're mostly magic shows. That's really what it comes down to, right? You show the baby a magic show, and the question is, does it, does, is it sort of surprised by the magic show, right? If it's surprised, this, the inference is, this has been something that's upset their expectations about the world. That's why they're surprised, OK? And that shows they have expectations about these things. All right? If they show no surprise, then we presume the magic show is just OK with them, and they haven't got any problem with it. So for example, it may surprise you to know that a four-month-old, I can't do this, of course, but the brilliance of experimental psychologists. They can figure out displays that will do this. If that little thing, this little uh, slide advancer were just floating out there in space right now, four-month-olds are not the least bit bothered by that. What you might guess they would know better than anything, namely gravity, they don't know. And the evidence is, is that somewhere between four and six months is where they get gravity. OK, uh, I've also mentioned contamination avoidance. This might strike you as a funny thing. I mean, look at this list already. This might strike you as a fairly funny thing to be talking about. But um, the, the easiest way I can make the point is, is when I was a kid growing up, it was called cooties. That was the game we played, OK? It was the cooties game. Now, the point about the cooties game is, first of all, it's across all cultures, OK? Everybody in this room grew up 
and knew, if you may not have played it, but you knew about it, okay? Now I realize most of you grew up here in the USA, but uh, believe me, it's out there, uh, all around. But the point about it is, is that it's principled, and it's principled across cultures, okay? Everybody knows that if I've got cooties, beware of this finger, right? All I have to do is just touch you, and you've got cooties, right? I don't have to embrace you, I don't have to, just, just one touch is enough to contaminate. Moreover, one touch, touch is enough to contaminate you completely, right? I mean, I may have been touched by the person who had cooties right here, but if I bump into you with this elbow, now you've got cooties. And on and on and on, okay? Um, yeah, I could talk a lot about that, but I won't. Okay, uh, lastly, uh, not lastly in the sense that this exhausts the list, just in terms of the examples I'm going to give you. Uh, what's, what in the technical uh, literature and the experimental literature is called theory of mind? That is to say, babies have got a very, very basic problem that they've got to get solved and got to get solved pretty quickly. And that is they've got to be able to figure out what things, what objects in their environments are agents and what are objects in their environment are not. Because it's a waste of time to be appealing to things that aren't agents for help. Okay? Now, you might think, oh, well, that's easy, right? I mean, it's just movement or something like that. Well, yeah, yeah, the story is a very long and complicated one. And indeed, the evidence is, is that it takes a number of years for kids to get complete, clear about this because the agents are the things you want to attribute minds to. Okay? Now, the minds are of greater and lesser amounts of fanciness, but the, the minds that really matter are, of course, the other human minds and figuring out what's going on in those minds and so on. This is a big story, right? I mean, it has a lot of foundations. One of them looks like it's a general capacity that not only do we have, but lots of other critters have as well. I mean, other animals are aware of the fact that there are certain kinds of things in their environment that either they can eat or they can eat them. Um, so predator and prey relationships matter here. But uh, specific capacities that look like they're based on human sociality have to do with uh, sensitivity to others' minds and the contents of their mental representations. Um, human beings are unmatched in dealing with complex social, the complex social universe um, by, uh, by appreciating the contents of other people's mental representations and actions. And of course, uh, my guess is, how many of you in here have, know about the false belief task? I'm assuming it's, oh, it's not most. Okay. Um, Famously, uh, it has been ascertained that uh, it looks like the world over, that until kids are about four years of age, um, they seem to not have a very clear understanding, at least they're unable to talk about their understanding, of the fact that other people can have false beliefs. Um, they're puzzled by that. Uh, they, they don't give the right answers when you ask them about circumstances that would seem to suggest that someone they're observing has a false belief. Um, there's interesting research that shows that if you don't ask them to say it, that in fact they do know it, but they can't say it. Now, remember that list. I talked about the difficulty of making things articulate, okay? All right. Um, all right, look, by now I'm done with part one. How am I doing? A little longer than I should have. Okay. Um, now I can state the thesis of what I'm going to, in effect, be uh, advancing here. I'm going to read this one to you, okay? By contrast with science, the cognitive activities underlying religion concern processes and products that rely less on cultural input and more on these domain specific maturationally natural cognitive systems. Okay. Now, there are really, I think, two grounds that can be discussed here. Um, not just cognition, but also a lot of considerations from natural history. Uh, so I'll say a few things about those fast, but my focus will be on, uh, sorry, on cognition. Uh, what I'm going to be suggesting is, is that religion relies on normal variations in the operations of garden variety cognitive mechanisms. But before I take that up, uh, I'd like to turn to the discussion of science. Um, so uh, let me turn to the second part of the talk. Um, about what I'm going to call the unnaturalness of science. Uh, as you may know, uh, my disciplinary background is uh, I'm a philosopher. Uh, it's 
My PhD is in philosophy. It's actually the only degree I have in philosophy. But um, um, I have the philosopher's, uh, alas, I have the philosopher's penchant to put the clarifications right up front. <laughs> Okay, instead of putting the whole view out and then sort of qualifying it, I want to tell you about a couple of qualifications at the start. Uh, the first is, is that I want to draw a distinction between science and technology. Okay? It's not to say that science and technology aren't intimately connected with one another in the world that we live in. They certainly are. Uh, and I think they certainly have been for now about 150 years, uh, basically since the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but it seems to me there are a variety of considerations that can lead to thinking about them and, and seeing that there is a basis for drawing a distinction between them. And sometimes that can be a helpful distinction. Um, there is a contrast between, as it were, a purely practical set of interests in contrast to what I take in science is both practical and theoretical interests. Um, it's, as it were, in science, oftentimes scientists really just are interested in understanding nature for its own sake, not because it's going to produce a particular machine or solve a particular practical problem that human beings face. Um, oh, sorry. Let's go back up. Uh, technology is prehistoric. Um, it's very, very early, uh, certainly, even prehistoric, uh, versus uh, this, this famous tie to science that it has, uh, which I think, as I said, is a phenomenon of the last 150 or 60 years or so. Uh, there's lots of technology before there's, I think, anything that's justifiably described as science, or at least interestingly described as science. Um, literacy is necessary for science, <clears throat> I think. Uh, and now I'm, you know, I mean, I'm talking about a science as a as a set of practices in a culture, uh, and um, in effect, you know, a kind of ongoing tradition of research. Um, there is no developing science among non-literate cultures. I'm just willing to make that assertion. Um, technology is ubiquitous in human cultures. All human cultures have make tools. Okay, but I think that it's not helpful to try to argue that all human cultures have science, even right now in the world. Um, and finally, and I, in some ways, I guess I take this as really the clincher, and that is technology is not even unique to us. I mean, we know about uh, the chimps since Jane Goodall, but uh, I mean, after all, there are new, new Caledonian crows, okay? I mean, bird brains, okay? And it turns out these bird brains are fantastic brains. They're terrific at making tools and innovate innovatively uh, in the face of new kinds of problems. I think that science is fairly described as being unique to human beings, certainly in this institutional sense and, and in this sense of sort of traditions of research that I've been talking about. Okay, that's the first qualification. Qualification number two is, is that some dimensions of science do involve natural cognitive inclinations. Um, what I have in mind here is the formulation of theories and sensitivity to the importance of evidence. Okay? Um, I think that human beings are natural theorizers. Right there, I've used that word natural again in a cognitive domain. I mean, when we run up against an anomaly, we're just like those kids in the developmentalist experiments. Whoa, what's happened here? I better think this through. And typically, what we do is leap to a new theory. It is the, I mean, there's lots of interesting and good developmental research being done out there, including by some folks right here in Seattle um, uh, on babies' sensitivity to evidence uh, and sort of understanding that if they get counter evidence, it matters. Um, but, I mean, both of these things are vitally important to science. But it seems to me that there's, you know, I mean, in short, the babies and, and actually all of us are much less good on the character of evidence and the import of evidence, let alone generating it. Uh, in short, what I want to say is, is that science involves another whole set of enterprises. Um, its products are radically counterintuitive, I think. In this sense, they're unnatural. Um, but, and, and because of that, they're difficult to learn and understand and master. But on the critical side of science, I mean, what, why evidence matters is, is it bears on how we assess these products, these theories. And that turns out to be a very, very difficult enterprise. Okay? 
All right. Um, the science is reliably advanced, usually sooner rather than later, representations that are radically counterintuitive. Science's products depart drastically from the deliverances of our maturationally natural systems. Science improves upon our maturationally natural systems. You know, the import of science is, is that the world is very different from the way it appears to be. Science generates, I believe, new ideas, more penetrating explanations that have genuine what I would call theoretical depth. That is to say, although a, th a theory might be uh, formulated for a particular problem, it can be extended into other domains that it was never intended to address. So Newton's theory could be extended to a theory about tides uh, and to make sense of those. Uh, and on and on and on. And that's how, as it were, scientific theories are independently testable. Science reorders, it recategorizes, it regroups by way of, now this, I'm going to read, I'm reading this because this is important, by way of unobvious regularities. Even in psychology and social science, unobvious regularities, let alone physics and biology, okay? Physical sciences and biological sciences. Um, based on imperceptible mechanisms and forces, Okay, even in psychology and social science. Um, this is in contrast to the properties and actions of agents, whether they're perceptible or not. Examples. I mean, the best example is the classic example of the scientific revolution. Um, I mean, we're, we're moving right now at 1,000 miles an hour. And yet no person's perceptual systems deliver this information to them. I mean, that's the Copernican insight. Solids, right? I mean, our best theories tell us this is overwhelmingly actually mostly empty space. This one might be a little harder to sort of see as radically counterintuitive, but I invite you to sort of get a little historical perspective, and that is the notion that microorganisms can kill macroorganisms. What's the best evidence for this being radically counterintuitive? Microscopy was invented in the 17th century. Von Leeuwenhoek had a microscope in the 1600s. It isn't until the 1800s that it began to dawn on people that maybe some of the things, the critters they're seeing through these microscopes may have something to do with disease. For 200 years, it was basically a non-starter. You know, there, no, there was no future to that hypothesis. And likewise in the psychological and social sciences. Um, I mean, all sorts of forms from uh, that we, things we've studied that, as it were, I mean, as you've, I know there are philosoph some philosophers in the room, as you've probably picked up, I'm an unabashed naturalist with, res with regard to my philosophy. Uh, there are philosophers, you know, who have, as it were, pronounced that pain has to be certain ways. Uh, and so on. Why? Well, because, as it were, it's inherent in the concept. Uh, well, you know, look, that just shows they don't know any cognitive science. Okay? For example, the discovery in 20th century psychology of Anton syndrome. What's Anton syndrome? Anton syndrome is blindness denial. Now, if you think that analyzing concepts is how you get insights about these things, you are not only never going to predict Anton syndrome, you're not going to not only not recognize it when you see it, right? I mean, it's, as it were, it's inconceivable. How could somebody be blind and not know that they're blind? But believe me, folks, there are hospitals in every major city in America, including right here in Seattle, eight or ten excuse me, eight or 10 patients with, with Anton syndrome. It's, it's by now a well-known phenomenon. Okay, radically counterintuitive, okay? Even about what we take to be our minds. Okay, um, a further consequence of science is radically counterintuitive representations is increasing restriction over time on the domains in which appeals to agent causality are deemed legitimate. Um, it seems to me that this is one way of sort of characterizing the history of science. Uh, in the ancient world, the sun, the moon, 
oceans, the winds, were agents, often gods. Uh, even up until the earliest decade, or the first decade of the 20th century, many, many folks thought that the way you explain the difference between living matter and, as it were, non-living matter is on the basis of vital spirits. But vital spirits have simply just disappeared. There's no longer, this just isn't a part of biological theorizing any longer. Now, I'm going to say something that you may find unsettling. Uh, but, you know, look, where are we going next? Especially over the last 50 years, psychology and um, uh, uh, the psychological and the sociocultural have frequently, uh, the sciences of these things, have frequently dispensed with appeals to the conscious mental operations of agents. As it were, we're even, as it were, in some domains, beginning to question that whole notion of invisible agency within us. Okay? Now, what I want to do is turn to cognitive processes, uh, to science's unnatural cognitive processes. I begin, first of all, by re-acknowledging my second clarification. Okay? Hypothesis formation and sensitivity to the importance of evidence are natural. However, what science also requires is the recognition. Remember I said, but there's so much more. Here's my quick summary of the so much more. All right. Science also requires uh, the recognition, collection, generation, analysis, and assessment of relevant empirical evidence for the purpose of criticizing theories. Now, a science education is supposed to make scientists experts at these tasks. But the problem is that involves forms of thought and types of practice that humans, including scientists, find extremely difficult to carry out. That difficulty is a function of the cognitive unnaturalness of these tasks. They don't rely on standard cognitive equipment. They're not abetted by maturationally natural inclinations. They often result in the rejection of those systems' verdicts. Scientists have this, now this is important. Scientists, here's the, here's the thesis, there are the subthesis right in here. Get ready, it's pretty startling. Scientists are human beings, <laughs> okay? Scientists have the same maturationally natural dispositions of mind that other human beings do. They're just as susceptible to, as everyone else is to motivated perception and to failures of memory and reasoning. Okay, the cognitive science of science, which is a, you know, a sub-discipline that's out there, has disclosed many challenges to grasping scientific claims and doing good science. For example, the persisting, persisting mistaken assumptions. What do I mean by this? I'm talking about the maturationally natural systems. The deliverances regularly reassert themselves. Remember, I told you they were automatic. If they're automatic, they stay automatic. They don't cease to be automatic. They still keep popping in there, OK? And that leads to recurring intrusions. And that constitutes an obstacle to learning and doing science. My favorite illustration of this is Mike McCloskey's research in physics, but there's lots of other stuff out there about this that I could talk about. Um, when you ask folks, here's a simple problem, right? Guys, run along with, with a slide uh, advancer, right? Trot along this way. Um, when he drops it, what is the path that the slide advancer will take? Okay, or the ball, or the red ball in this case. Okay, we've got three options here. All right, uh, and the question is, which one's the right one? When you ask naive subjects, the overwhelming answer is B. And if you ask them, well, what do you, how do you know that? And they say, well, look, I mean, when you're running along, see it drops, and you can see it drops straight down. And that's an important point, because the point about this is, is that's the wrong answer, okay? But people are completely, unaware of this, the these relatively ordinary phenomena pose perceptual, explanatory, and predictive problems that go completely unrecognized. I mean, after all, they can see it's dropping straight down as they run along. I trust everybody's with me, and you've got the point there, OK? Um, the correct answer is A. But the most important part of this research, and now here's the, here's the punchline about this research, is that what McCloskey finds is that over 25% of students who have successfully passed a year of high school physics or a semester of college mechanics 
revert to be. That's what I mean by the intrusion of maturationally natural conceptions. About 10% of naive subjects give uh, C. We can talk about that if you want to later. OK, I have, I have a view about that. OK, persisting mistaken assumptions. Uh, difficulties assessing probabilistic evidence. Uh, Daniel Kahneman has won a Nobel Prize in economics uh, because of his work with Amos Tversky, who would have won it one as well, but he was dead, and they don't give them to dead people. Um, what they showed, in short, is, is that everybody is rotten at uh, carrying out probabilistic inference, okay? That people routinely violate the norms. Um, the crucial point about this, I have actually, I heard Dan Kahneman once speak, actually, in, here in Seattle is where I heard him uh, years ago. Uh, he, made a, he made a great comment. He said, you know, we never even are interested in a problem unless it's the case that even after we understand the problem and know what the normatively correct answer is, it still feels wrong, OK? Um, likewise, inferential fallacies and failures in other domains. Um, most famously with conditional inference. I know I've got some psychologists in the room. Here's a version of the Waste and Four Card Selection task. Uh, for, how many of you know this task? OK, again, not just about half. OK. All right, here you got a little universe. There are four cards in this universe. That's it, just four. Here's a description of those cards, OK? Every card's got a number on one side, a letter on the other side, OK? Up there is a rule, a law of that universe, OK? And what you have to do is figure out whether or not that law is true, OK? This is a version of the Waste and Four Card Selection Task. What's the point? The point is, is that about 80% of subjects get this wrong. The very first time, I'm, this, is, this is old home week. The very first time I ever saw this task was right over in a lecture hall at the University of Washington when I was here for six weeks in 1981. Um, and I got it wrong. I was in a room filled with philosophy professors. And about 80% of them got it wrong. OK? All right, well, the answers are A and 3. but. The crucial point about this is, is that this, and this is what you know, makes philosophy professors just embarrassed as can be, because these are the two most basic forms of hypothetical inference. They're called modus ponens and modus tollens. But when you put them in a form like this, all of a sudden, people are baffled. Okay? The crucial point here is, is that it's this kind of hypothetical inference that's pivotal in science. Here's a hypothesis. How do you test it? And the answer is 80% of us are clueless most of the time. OK? All righty. Um, another consideration. And I'm, by the way, this is not an exhaustive list. It's a representative list. Confirmation bias. Um, in short, uh, we tend not to try to go out and find evidence that defeats our theories. Or if we do find evidence that defeats our theories, we work very hard to explain it away. Uh, what makes science work, and indeed this is going to be my line further on, right, is that uh, um, uh, it's a social set of arrangements. And that is to say we're not so great at sort of figuring out how to defeat our own theories, but we're really terrific at figuring out how to generate evidence that might defeat our competitor's theory. All right? Um, this is uh, uh, akin to what uh, Dan Ariely calls the IKEA effect. Um, this is the scientific version of the IKEA effect. If you don't know what the IKEA, I, my guess is there's a fair number of folks in here who've got at least a piece of furniture from the IKEA, from IKEA, okay? Um, there's a very, very standard finding that's been replicated, and that is if you have a piece of IKEA furniture, you are quite likely to overvalue it. That is to say, you think it's worth a lot more than it is on the market, okay? Whoa, well, that, that, that set of shelves, those must be worth at least 400 bucks, right? <laughs> Why do people have this view about their IKEA furniture? Because they built it themselves. OK? How does science proceed in the face of this set of disastrous cognitive set, set of cognitive considerations? Scientific competence requires literacy, linguistic and mathematical, extensive formal training and prolonged apprenticeships. Modern science, and here's my punchline, right, involves special social arrangements 
and an institutional infrastructure. Labs, departments, journals, societies, institutes, and so on. I'm taking too long. I'm going to have to go faster. I can see that. Most importantly, things like uh, and sustaining standards like peer review and the replicability of experimental evidence and its public availability. Um, the hope is, is that the collective outrun in the long, uh, sorry, the collective outcome in the long run uh, exceeds individual efforts in the short run. Okay, that's my fast story on science. Now let's move to religion. Um, I said the naturalness of religion. Uh, I said that there were two kinds of considerations, both cognitive and what I call natural historical uh, considerations. Uh, let me just briefly review those. First of all, religion, like technology, dates from our prehistoric past. Okay, get ready for this one. Um, religion may not have been unique to human beings. Now note, the operative auxiliary verb there may not have been, okay? Depends, I mean, I, I don't have a strong view about this, but I just invite you to consider the following. If a species buries its dead and does so in a non-random way, is that evidence that it's, you know, as it were, has some religion? Okay, however you might want to characterize that. Now, if your answer to that is yes, then you probably have to buy into this claim because Neanderthals certainly buried their dead and they did so in non-random ways. Okay? Religion arises in every human culture. I've tried to suggest that one of the claims I've been making about science is that's not true about science. Okay? Uh, and religious ideas and forms have recurred throughout history across a wide array of physical and cultural settings. Um, This is in contrast to what I was calling the radically counterintuitive and novel character of so many scientific claims. But now I want to make a quick footnote here, because it's going to matter, and that is, is that this resembles the, uh, the scientific representations resemble the elaborated representations of theological elites. What I'm interested in is what I'll call popular religion, okay? Popular religion involves assumptions that are more common, materials that are more familiar, and judgments that are more intuitive. Religion employs ideas and forms of thought that are naturally appealing to human minds. As Claude Levi-Strauss once famously said, some ideas are good to think, just the same way that some foods are good to eat. Okay? Uh, there is neither a psychological nor a logical unity to the systems in question. And of course, what I'm talking about are those naturally natural systems. This enables me to set up a two-by-two two table here that will help situate things in a highly idealized way, and I want to make that clear. I mean, these look like four cells, but they're probably all continua, okay? But if you go out on the extreme ends of a continuum, you've got something that looks like two rather different categories, all right? Uh, so two cons uh, considerations. One is what I've called unrestricted appeals to agent causality and contrast to restricted appeals. And the second is this distinction I started out with in the cognition section, the distinction between offline reflective thinking as opposed to the maturationally natural version of the intuitive thinking, okay? Um, well, where does science go? Science has, I've argued, progressively restricted appeals to agent causation over its history. Uh, and of course, it's offline and reflective. It's not maturationally natural. Um, common sense explanations, Many of them, remember the babies are clear about the fact that uh, it's not the case that two things can occupy the same space at the same time. That doesn't got anything to do with agents, okay? So there's a whole bunch of common sense explanations that, that fit in that cell. Um, theology, it seems to me, something, I mean, also there are lots of forms of reflection about religion and they're not just theological, but those are the ones I suspect that are of greatest interest uh, to actually probably everyone. Um, theology is an offline reflective activity carried out in literate cultures in the same way that science is carried out in literate cultures. Uh, my former colleague uh, Frederick Barth spent 11 months among the Bakhtaman of New Guinea and he said although I heard dozens and dozens of what we would call religious claims every day, he said I never once heard what anyone would be tempted to call a theological utterance. 
Okay? The point is, is theology is not necessary for popular religion. And of course, where I want to put popular religion is in that cell. Now, there's an interesting little pair, well, a little, a little kind of irony that arises here. And that is uh, by doing a science-religion comparison looking at cognition, in an odd kind of way, I'm suggesting that science-religion comparisons are sort of ill-conceived. Ill Why? Because it turns out both science and popular religion are both more like theology and more like common sense explanations than they are like each other. That is to just say they're not on, in either vertical or horizontal in this table. Okay. All right, now let's turn to religion's cognitive products. Popular religion involves only modestly counterintuitive representations at most of special sorts of agents that arise on the basis of normal variations in the operations of garden variety, domain specific, maturationally natural cognitive equipment. The way I want to explicate this is to basically look at the italicized phrases. So, first, why does religion involve only modestly counterintuitive representation? Sometimes people use, oh, no, not sometimes, actually most people use the language of minimally counterintuitive for a variety of reasons. I'm a little hesitant about that. I prefer modestly. And that's because they involve <laughs> limited, I'm, I'm modest about this, yes, uh, because they involve limited violations in three familiar domains. Okay, for those of you who've read Pascal Boyer's Religion Explained, or some of, actually, it's really actually more in some of Pascal's other papers that this comes out most prominently. Um, I'm going to just now in this next slide rehearse Pascal's views, right? Um, Boyer argues that religious representations are substantially constrained on two crucial fronts. Uh, first is, is that they involve violations in only three, in three ontological domains, intuitive physics, intuitive biology, and intuitive psychology. Secondly, he argues that there are basically only two kinds of violations that occur, what he, call, or, uh, what he calls breaches and transfers. Okay? Um, transfers. A mountain that is alive transfers a suite of biological properties to a physical object. A snake that talks transfers psychological capacities to an organism without them. Okay? Breaches, by contrast, transgress an assumption about a domain. Uh, a ghost who walks through walls violates the notion that, those, remember the babies, they know this. Things don't walk through walls, right? That's not how it works. Um, uh, by the way, this is not sexism. Man is three letters. Woman and person are more, and if I put them in, they wouldn't fit. Okay? All right. Give me, cut me a break here. Um, um, a man who cures others instantly um, um, is a breach of our understanding of, of sort of how uh, disease works. Uh, and a person who knows others' thoughts uh, violates our presumptions about psychology. I mean, we're pretty good at reading other people's minds, but we know that we don't sort of literally know other people's thoughts. OK. The argument that Boyer makes is, is that these resulting modestly counterintuitive representations achieve a cognitive optimum. And this is what makes them culturally prominent they're the kinds of ideas that humans like to think. They're attention grabbing. OK, you got these violations. Whoa, OK, he can fly, huh? All right. They're highly memorable. And there's empirical evidence that actually even Justin Barrett has been involved in producing some of that. Uh, but and likewise, Boyer, across cultures and across religious systems. And most importantly, in some ways, they authorize default inferences connected with the ontological domains. I'll say a bit more about that in just a second. OK. Why are these representations modestly counterintuitive at most? Because they're mostly not counterintuitive. The ontologies of popular religion are easy to use by deploying, by deploying the, matur uh, the default inferences of maturationally natural systems. Knowing that something is an agent, just knowing that, that alone allows us to infer that it has goals, desires, and preferences. It has a mind, in other words. That it finds some attitudes and behaviors offensive, and that it's disinclined to help anyone who manifests such. The point about this is, is that such knowledge about religion comes for free. This is part of humans' maturationally natural knowledge about the world that they live in. Okay? Why are the variations in the operation of this garden variety cognitive equipment normal? And that's because they arise in a lot of other contexts. So this analysis isn't just about religion. 
I should go back and, by the way, say in that two by two table, those are not the only things that fit in those cells also. Okay? There are other things that go in those cells. Uh, here, I mean, what are we talking about? Folk tales, fantasy, fiction, commercials, cartoons, comic books, superheroes, and on and on and on. Hollywood and advertisers know about this just as well as cognitive scientists of religion. Okay, let me quickly turn to the processes, the cognitive processes, and I'll still, I think, be under an hour. Okay? Um, popular religion makes comparatively light cognitive demands uh, because popular religions engage domain-specific knowledge that virtually all humans possess. Therefore, humans' maturation and actual cognitive capacities equip them to acquire religion. Crucially, they equip them to acquire religion in a way that is not at all true about acquiring science. Science takes a lot of hard work. We are not, Alison Gottnick and Andy Meltzoff and others, to the contrary notwithstanding, we are not born scientists but we might be born believers. Okay, I mentioned some systems before, okay? <laughs> Language is a maturationally natural system. How does religion engage it? We all talk, I mean, you know, that's no news, all right? But I would suggest by the linguistic cues and glossolalia. Whether you realize it or not, I mean, I realize I've, I've got a lot of uh, folks who indeed are Christians in the room. Uh, glossolalia is not something that is confined to Christianity. It's in lots of religions, okay? What goes on? Now, there's all sorts of interesting things about our linguistic processing. I mean, all right, I'm gonna take a minute or two more. For example, if I make noise, Okay? Those are noises. You hear them, right? I mean, you can hear that. But now I'm going to make some noise, and you're going to find that it's, you've got two ways of hearing, and whether you realize it or not, you can't control them. Because here is an illustration of how you can't hear certain things as just noise. Namely, it's the sounds I'm producing right this minute. Try, try as hard as you can to hear the sounds I'm producing right now as noise. You will find it's impossible. You have got to process these as language, as meaningful language. That's just what's going on there. Okay? Cueing contamination when marking off sacred spaces and objects. This is not tough, right? There are all kinds of things we do, like walk circuitously around certain special spots. That's it. Everybody knows. If you're in some context, that must be where the cooties are, okay? Or that must be where the contaminants, are, you know, or, the, or the, the sacred things are. Oftentimes, religions invert this, which is to say, right, we're the ones with the cooties, right? That's why we shouldn't touch this stuff, okay? Uh, and queuing theory of mind. This is far and away the most robust and most important. Uh, myths or narratives. Uh, stories that turn on agent causality, yielding, and as soon as you, you know, weave together a bunch of events as an as a issue, a story about what an agent's doing and thinking, you've got a narrative. And as soon as you've got a narrative, you have instant mnemonic advantages. Yeah, I'll say something about that in a minute. Uh, and instant plausibility. So that, for example, when we go to plays or we read stories, we talk about the inevitable love story. No, it's inevitable. We know how this works, right? Uh, Massimo Piacatelli Paul Marini calls this the Othello effect. If you're a Shakespearean, okay, and you know the play Othello, this is what Iago does at every stage in the play. He just cues enough information to tie a bunch of things together to make out a plausible narrative. And people just, all those characters, the tragic characters, leap at that, Othello in particular. Rituals or actions. A, this is called hand waving. Tom Lawson and I have written two books about it. If you want to talk about it, we can. Okay? Our crucial claim is, is that the same representational machinery that we use for making sense of actions among the events that occur in our world are the ones that we use to account for our transactions with the gods. 
And the gods are mostly like us, okay? Uh, here is not the, the, I mean, there's a point about icons to be made here, but this is mostly a psychological point, not one about biology or, or, or physical shapes or things like that of icons and so on. Um, this uh, generates the famous uh, theological incorrectness uh, phenomena, and I'll tell you just very briefly as the last sort of substantive slide in this section about research that Justin Barrett famously I say famously because uh, it, was, it was a pretty startling thing, it seems to me, when he and Frank Kyle found that it turns out that when people are dealing with religious inferences and religious representations online, that everything they say about them offline goes right out the window. Okay, if you ask people what they believe offline, reflectively, they'll tell you, you know, well, they do. They'll just, they'll recite the stuff they've memorized in Sunday school. They know their doctrines, right? They, they can just cite that stuff right away. You give them a bunch of stories about God and people interacting. Stories that are written in a way that attempts to be, and you know, I think for the most part is completely consistent with the theologically correct beliefs that they told you they have. And then you give them a memory test. Okay, and son of a gun, how do they remember these stories? God suddenly is Superman. That's really what it comes down to. Okay, uh, he can hear people who are closer to him better than he can hear people farther away from him. It takes him a little bit to get from one place to the other, and on and on and on. Okay, um, this is a finding again that has been done across cultures, across religious systems. Um, note. It's just like the intrusion of the maturationally natural dispositions of mind in McCloskey's experiments. Remember, a quarter of the kids who had taken the physics classes at Johns Hopkins, no less, reverted to the maturationally natural conception. Okay, same things going on here. All right, this was the uh, last slide. Okay, last slide is six unexpected consequences. I'm just going to read through them because I've taken my hour. Uh, one, I argue that theological incorrectness isn't just something that occurs. It is inevitable. Okay? You can talk about that if you'd like. Second, science poses no significant challenge to the persistence of religion. Contrary to the, all of the uh, folderol that has surrounded this issue for 150 years or more. Okay? Well, ar arguably 400 years at least. Um, if religion is natural in the way, cognitively natural in the way that I've described, religious ideas, and I'll just make this assertion, they inevitably pop up in human populations. Relevant domain-specific cognitive disabilities will render religious representations baffling. By the way, I say these are unexpected consequences. Some of this stuff, uh, my claim is always there'll be at least one that surprises people, okay? This is usually the one that surprises people, okay? Uh, what I'm saying is, is that there are certain people who walk around on this planet who are clueless about religion, all right? And they're called people who are autistic because people who are autistic allegedly have an impaired theory of mind. And so much of religion turns on deploying theory of mind, okay? The locus of scientific rationality, now I'm going to say some things about science. The locus of scientific rationality is not between matched pairs of human ears. The locus of scientific rationality is in a community of inquirers, a coordinated community of inquirers, and an organized institutional setting. Religion has less need of institutional support than science. Like I said, I think it pops up inevitably. Science is, in fact, I think in the course of human history quite rare. And this one, may be of some surprise to you, but my view is, is that it's science's continued existence that's actually fragile. What's in danger is our loss of science. And if you don't think, I mean, if you, if you think that's just overdone rhetoric, I would just simply invite you to consider the fact that, I mean, the standard story in the history of science is, is the Greeks invented what I would be wanting to call sort of serious ongoing science, okay? And then it disappeared. And it had to be rediscovered. And it had to be, in effect, reinvented. I don't think that there's anything about, anything I've said about how human minds work that would ever prevent the loss of science again. If you like this story, so shameless self-promotion. There's a book. 
I'll be happy to autograph it for you. Oh, um, Gary, by the way, Gary Larson gets science right, right? Involves all these abstract, very radically counterintuitive uh, and hard forms, uh, radically counterintuitive outcomes and, and hard forms of thinking. He also gets religion right, uh, right? Uh, this is God makes the snake. Uh, God says, boy, they're a cinch, right? He's like a little, my, like my older granddaughter. He knows how to make a snake with clay, okay? But of course, the point about this is, is the comment that it's a cinch. If you're God, everything's a cinch. Thank you. Is it? All right, thanks. Thanks very much, Bob. It was a lot of fun. Never gets old. <laughs> yeah, that means I've heard versions of this, but actually you've got some new material in there. Uh, and I'll remember anyway. I should have read the book more carefully, I suppose. He was good enough to autograph it for me. Um, we don't have a lot of time, so I'll launch into a few comments. And really what I want to talk about, Bill is more building off of what Professor Macaulay shared with us, then challenging him on any particulars, because I just think he's right for the most part. I mean, I don't see a whole lot to quibble with there. So I won't. But what I will try to do very quickly is bring around what he was talking about in terms of the naturalness of religion to the topic of this conference, which is, is Christianity natural? I think it's just a wonderful question for a conference. It's a wonderful question for probably a series of books, too, or something like that, because, well, it can be addressed in a good number of ways, um, even if we just rein it into sort of scientific analyses. I mean, we can uh, wonder, well, natural in what respect? And Professor Macaulay has given us uh, at least a couple of ways to think about naturalness. One is in terms of this automaticity and ease, cognitive naturalness. Um, but then even dividing that in terms of maturational versus practiced naturalness. So which is it? Is Christianity more practiced naturalness or maturational natural? And uh, then even when we're talking about that kind of naturalness, of course, well, which aspects of Christianity? The beliefs, which beliefs? The practices, which practices? Um, and so forth and so on. So it's a really rich question, pregnant with possibilities, and that's only taking that sort of cognitive approach, let alone some of the neighboring evolutionary kinds of approaches where we might uh, be interested in whether or not uh, certain aspects of Christianity ride on um, evolutionary adaptations, for instance. Can I say that at SPU? Yeah. Uh, okay. Um, we might wonder about those things, or which of these really are riding on evolutionary byproducts. So it's a wonderful topic for us, and that of course um, I can't answer, uh, so I won't try to entirely, but by natural, let's focus where Professor Macaulay focused, maturationally natural cognition. And my reason for doing that is because the more undergirded by maturationally natural cognition Christian beliefs and practices are, the more likely they are to be natural in either sense, in terms of practiced expertise becoming second nature or first nature, maturationally natural and then useful and able to be used in real time to do real work in real people's lives, okay? And that's what Christianity, I think, generally thinks that it's about, is what real people do in real time. So let's focus on maturationally natural. Is Christianity maturationally natural? Well, if we look at many Christian beliefs, the easy answer seems to be no. Uh, no, it isn't terribly natural. God, as an atemporal, immaterial, fully omnipotent, omniscient, immutable person who is three persons, doesn't seem very natural in a maturationally natural sense, right? And indeed, as Professor Macaulay ended with, it appears from some research in cognitive science of religion that many Christian ideas, such as these divine attributes, may not even reach practice naturalness in many people and in many contexts. They're just too hard, OK? 
okay? But it would be overstating it to say that Christianity is entirely decoupled from maturationally natural cognition. If it were, based on Professor Macaulay's analysis, then when various communist regimes have tried to eliminate Christianity by eliminating the institutions and cultural support, uh, it, they would have had a lot more success than they have had, all right? Christianity, at least in one form or another, seems to be able to persist without strong cultural scaffolding, including literacy, which seems to be a really powerful form, form of scaffolding. That many not very natural systems of thought seem to require. Christianity doesn't, at least in some forms. Okay? And I keep hedging that because I recognize that there are certain forms of Christianity that are more or less maturationally natural. At least that would be my contention, but that's a whole other discussion. Um, I've previously suggested that what we, what we can call the sort of religion that is uh, maturationally natural, natural religion, just for fun. And that um, while unlike the scientific study of language, which is a good head start on us, uh, the study of what we might call natural religion remains in its infancy, but we can begin to offer some tentative, a tentative listing of its features. And let me just do that and see where Christianity falls on, on these dimensions. Research into children's acquisition of religious ideas and cross-cultural comparisons suggests that what I'm calling natural religion includes several assumptions, um, or sort of developed intuitions, if you will, that elements of the natural world, rocks, trees, mountains, and animals, are purposefully and intentionally designed by someone. And it's not a very hard inference to think that that, that someone then has to have the power to do that. Oh, and by the way, humans aren't the someone. They don't have that kind of power. Uh, things happen in the world that unseen agents cause, and these agents are not humans or animals of the normal sort. Humans have some internal components such as a mind, soul, or spirit that are distinguishable from the body, that is, we are intuitive dualists. Moral norms seem to be unchangeable even by the gods. Immoral behavior leads to misfortune, moral behavior to fortune. Ritualized behavior, such as marking off special spaces or ritual cleansings, can protect from unseen hazards, cooties, including those caused by the gods. Um, some components of humans, that has agency, such as souls or minds or spirits, making continue to exist without earthly bodies after death. And it's not hard for those to then become ancestors or gods in their own right. These gods exist with thoughts, wants, perspectives, and free will to act, much like human beings. Gods may be invisible and mortal, but they're not outside of space and time, it appears. Gods can and do interact with the natural world and people, perhaps especially those that are ancestors of the living and hence have an interest in the living. This interaction with the world accounts for perceived agency and purpose in the world that cannot be accounted for by human or animal activity or other mechanical sorts of things. Gods generally know things that animals, uh, sorry, that humans do not. They can be super knowing, super perceiving, or both. Perhaps particularly things that are important for human social interactions. They're cosmic gossips. They know the good stuff. Gods, because of their access to relevant information and special powers, may be responsible for instances of fortune or misfortune. They can reward or punish human actions. And because of their superhuman power, when gods act, they act permanently. And so when they act in religious rituals, the religious ritual need not be repeated. That one sound familiar? <laughs> I mean this listing of the features of natural religion to be illustrative and tentative rather than exhaustive and definitive. Additional research is needed to substantiate or falsify the various aspects of natural religion. Other cognitive scientists of religion would undoubtedly offer additional features, but I think these are good candidates and they seem to support each other's intuitive plausibility. Now this natural religion subsequently becomes specified, amplified, or even contradicted in particular cultural settings, what we often call theology, not unlike how we learn particulars of our native language. For instance, in Christianity, Islam, and Judaism, uh, the idea of a god or gods purposefully orders the world is elaborated in the notion of a supreme cosmic creator. One, not a whole bunch that are working on a team. Um, further steps might include specifying the properties of the creator, such as being non-spatial or non-temporal or a trinity, as in Christianity. But note that with each level of amplification or elaboration, these ideas move, often move further away from natural religion. They become less maturationally natural oftentimes, but not necessarily. 
Another example pertains to the nature of humans and what happens after death. Natural religion grants some component of humans can continue to exist after death. Such a notion can remain fairly vague, as was arguably the case for the ancient Hebrews. But alternatively, the nature of, his, of existence after death can be amplified into ideas about ghosts or ancestor spirits, which we see in much of the world, or patterns of reincarnation, or bodily resurrection, as we see in Christianity. Okay, Christianity then builds upon natural religion in some elaborations that, while not natural, are not counter-natural in many respects. Okay, modestly counterintuitive. Or maybe not counterintuitive at all, but just elaborations that aren't specified by maturationally natural cognition. And maybe Christian afterlife beliefs may be examples of such an elaboration. But in some cases, Christianity may be counter-natural or even counterintuitive. And you know, I'll come back to cooties because that was a really nice example. Um, they are extremely natural, right? In religious systems, cooties lead to certain types of rituals to counter contamination. Some people have cooties and they need to be ritually removed. Certain behaviors may, may make you ritually unclean. This is natural religion. But here's a case in which maybe Christianity actually challenges this kind of natural religion. Jesus appeared to teach against this kind of natural religion. People aren't unclean because of their lack of ritual observances, he challenged the Pharisees, such as ritually cleaning their hands, but are unclean because of what they say and do. The doctrine of grace maybe is another example, that one can be given unmerited favor and forgiveness may be counterintuitive, running against natural intuitions governing exchange relations and how to handle coalition defectors. An exhaustive analysis about which aspects of Christianity are largely maturationally natural or not would be, well, exhausting, as well as exhaustive. It'd be exhausting. And the science isn't mature enough yet to attempt it. But the project would be exciting. Attempting to analyze Christianity in terms of its cognitive naturalness could be very fruitful in terms of identifying just where Christianity deviates from many other folk religions. It gives us, uh, another way to say that is, Cognitive approach gives us tools for doing comparative religion that we didn't, pro we didn't have before, including comparative theology. And I don't see that that project has really begun in earnest. We've been so focused on well, what are the commonalities that we haven't paid a lot of attention to the differences, which could be a lot of fun. But it could also be useful in terms of which aspects of Christianity are more or less difficult to learn, to transmit, to think about, and use in real time. Which aspects are more or less likely to become second nature? And I'll end right there. Thanks. Mm -hmm. Our host has left us. <laughs> Mike, come back, Mike. Well, since he's not here, I guess we can take a couple of questions until he runs us out of the room. So, um, Adam. Um, so, so I noticed in the in the four by four from the from the um, I finished presentation. Yeah. So I had to, I had to sort of make some adjustments to the shuttle. So, so we've we, got one, we've got yeah, one question that Bob needs to answer in there. Well, actually, no. We have we actually have ten minutes now for question and answer. If you're willing to if you're willing to do that for us. So um, first, let me shut off the screen. Distraction. Actually, that one shouldn't make any noise, so go ahead. Okay, so in the 4x4 you present, um, I thought it was interesting you put popular religion in the, the bottom, bottom left, but throughout the talk you're not necessarily careful to just say popular religion. You say religion, and after all, the title of the book is Why Religion is Natural. I guess Although I like a lot of your framework and a lot of the tools and a lot of the distinctions it brings in and allows us to discuss, I, I worry a little bit about whether we've implicitly uh, taken a stance where the maturationally natural stuff, that's, that's the heart of religion. And then, you know, theology or any sort of practice naturalness that comes in with spiritual disciplines and formation, that's kind of like epiphenomena, right? So, you know, when you evaluate any given... Okay, well, I'm happy to hear, see that because it seems like, you know, I don't want to commit to the idea that the evaluation of a religion 
stands or falls with the evaluation of the maturation of natural stuff on its own, right? And that it's important that you know someone's conception of religion might include the maturation of foundational stuff, but also rope in a lot of other stuff as essential. So, okay, uh, from the from back uh, from a cognitive standpoint, I think that the maturation of natural stuff is the heart of religions. Okay, um, but it doesn't follow that other things that go on in religion that are carried out at the reflective level are epiphenomenal uh, at all. Uh, it seems to me that religions, uh, remember I said I'm not out to give a comprehensive theory of religion, I'm not out to give a comprehensive theory of religious cognition. Um, I've just got some things that seem to me to get us some tools that give us a little leverage to help us advance our thinking and our understanding of these matters. Um, uh, in literate cultures, uh, the theological enterprise ends up being very important. Uh, at least, I mean, you know, I don't, well, let's put it this way, at least in the, in the framework of thinking about competition, for example, between religions. Um, uh, yeah, that's what I'm going to say for now, for a quick answer. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, given how you understand science, do you think that there is a folk science, or does that those categories not uh, coherent. Well, obviously that's a that's a, a category that I'm a little. It's a little more difficult for me to accommodate. Uh, but you know, I mean, there's science, and then there's science, right? Um, I mean, for example, uh, the research that uh, you know got got McNulls off uh, and Cool have done, or the, uh, the research that. Uh, uh, other developmentalists have done, you know, I mean, the way, the, I'm going to use a metaphor right now, I and mean, I actually think metaphors can be very, very helpful a lot of the time. I think that there's scientific cognition, sparks of scientific cognition that occur in virtually every human mind. And so that means in every human culture. Okay, remember, I've already committed myself to the view that theorizing and sensitivity to the evidence is something that I think is pretty natural to human minds. Um, so there, I think there's plenty of sparks out there. I think they're out there all the time. Uh, anytime any of us face those situations, those poor babies do when the developmentalists do those experiments with them. Anytime we face something that's really unexpected. We didn't, you know, it was utterly contrary to our expectation. Wow, why did this happen? Um, okay, it's uh, it's 11.30 for me. Uh, <laughs> I was a further comment I want to make. Uh, um, I think that also there might be said to be in certain cultures what we might call brush fires from those sparks. Okay? But what I'm interested in is the kind of big things that the Forest Service has finally learned to do. I'm talking about big controlled fires. Right, that are organized institutionally and uh, are under very tight control. Uh, and um, I mean, if you follow the metaphor, uh, okay. Um, there is an important sense, and you know, frankly, my view is is that from an epistemic standpoint. Now, I'm speaking as a philosopher. From an epistemic standpoint, I think, frankly, also from an historical standpoint, it's that rich, full-blooded notion of science that's the important one. Uh, that's the one that really matters for most of our epistemic concerns and for most, actually, I think for most of our historical concerns. Um, a wonderful book, uh, uh, Jim Al-Khalili's book, The House of Wisdom. I heartily recommend it to you all. It's about, uh, you know, medieval Islamic science. And I think that, uh, this is, I've read this book since I wrote mine, I wish I'd read it before, because I mean, I think he makes a plausible case that for about 60 years, uh, in of all places, Baghdad, there was science in the 10th century. Uh, and, you know, that's, that's more than even a brush fire. It was a real controlled burn, but then things fell apart. So, uh, was it folk science? What was the phrase you used? Right. Yeah, folk science. Uh, I think that, that the phenomena that are typically called folk science 
are perfectly consistent with the analysis I've just offered. Amy? Other than the language, which I believe is totally natural in the name, although I believe it's the structure and not the content, so I'm not sure how religion would sort of equate with the structure and not the content part of the naturalness of the language. But this contamination, I, I, I really have a hard time with that one because I don't think kids at all know about germs or even understand that at all. And theory of mind, basic physics, all those seem to be more an understanding of a regularity that exists in our world than a regularity that's in people's minds. Let's say we were suddenly born into another universe. Would our minds all, always go back to this innateness that you think is born in our minds? Or is it just the regularities that exist in the world, our mind then is able to cue into those, and things where there's not regularities into the world, those look like practice naturalists or schematic. So people who live in plain terrains with no mountains, they don't develop depth perception, although we would think depth perception is natural. It's not. So how much of this is just a regularity in our world and less of a regularity of our mind? Um, okay. Well, there, uh, there are many things to say because you actually touch on lots of big issues. <laughs> <laughs> One, I mean, empirical issues as well in some cases. I'm going to try to, I want to say straight away that I think that um, I'm, I remember, I warned you in advance amongst my colleagues, including this one over here, um, I'm, I'm rather less of a nativist than most of them, even about language, actually, okay? Uh, I'm not saying that the native story is wrong. I just think that there, it, it, I think it's an open question. I think there's lots of interesting scientific evidence on both sides. That said, I think that all of these systems meet, uh, as it were, naturally develop although I've generally avoided using the language of develop because it's already been used in another setting that's closely related, but naturally mature uh, in interaction with environments. And you've used an example from the visual system. I'd be very interested in knowing the studies that you're alluding to. Uh, I'm aware of, of uh, studies that pertain to that, and actually Joe Henrik and I have published a paper together in which uh, we point out that uh, um, even the visual system is tuned by culture. Uh, there's there's uh, really, I think, very striking evidence for that uh, amongst some uh, matters that uh, the modularists have thought were their sort of pillars of their positions. Um, Theory of mind, uh, the only comment I'll make quickly about that is, is the, the naturalness with which humans opt for theory of mind. I just invite you to ponder the number of times you've spoken to your computer, and if you lived where I did for the first 33 years of my life, you begged your car to start. <laughs> um, we do it all the time. Uh, contamination, um, first of all, you're absolutely right about this. Contamination is not in there initially. The babies, I mean, parents in this room who have raised babies, that's me, I've done not only my own kid, but my grandchildren, right? I mean, there's a, there's a point in life when they, they think playing with their poo is pretty cool, right? Um, contaminants, hey! Um, no, this is the, the evidence looks like this, gets, this is a system that is tuned. Um, and by the way, I, my language in the book is, is that culture infiltrates most of these systems and tunes them. Okay, in the same way that if you grow up in America, you probably get tuned to speak English. If you grow up in Norway, you probably get tuned to speak Norwegian. Okay, um, what you take to be a contaminant depends on your culture. Remember the point I made. The point is, is that the principles are general across all cultures, whatever you take the contaminant to be. Our friend Harvey Whitehouse tells a great story when he was in uh, East New Britain Island. He was talking to one of his uh, native informants uh, uh, one evening, uh, and um, this gigantic, I mean, in the south, in Georgia, we have huge roaches. We have roaches the size of mice, okay? They're euphemistically <laughs> called palmetto bugs. Um, but they're roaches, be very clear about that. Um, and in New Guinea, they have roaches the size of birds, okay? Uh, and Harvey was standing there one evening, right, and this 
roach, bird-sized roach, just flew down and landed on his chest, right? And it was like, ah! You know, um, before Harvey could do anything, this guy grabbed this roach, threw it, threw it right in the fire. You also had one, one of these instances where they said, you're going to eat that? Well, I was just going to, don't steal my punchlines. <laughs> Justin, this is called timing. <laughs> Even at 11.30 at night. <laughs> then, of course, the punchline is the guy reached down, pulled the roach out, and ate it. <laughs> okay? Culture tunes these contamination systems. So why are we germ experts? Why would you call that? We are not germ experts. Let's be, I, so, sorry, I'm glad you mentioned that again. <laughs> Crucial point about this. There's loads of evidence, including, by the way, evidence in the Bible that people were cued into this issue about contaminants long before there was ever a germ theory of disease. Literally thousands of years before anybody ever thought of a germ theory of disease. I guess I, I don't get why that's just not a regularity of the world. It's that germs can kill people. That has nothing to do with our brain. If you don't know that germs exist, then that's not a regularity of your world. And people didn't know germs existed until about 300 years ago. That's just an historical fact. We can talk more. Think about it. One last question. Joe, yeah. Or go ahead. I guess I want a clarification. We're not really talking about Christianity in this discussion, are we? Because in the way you talked about religion, it seemed like theology was the science of, or uh, theology was the science of religion. And does that include, you know, Christianity? We're not saying Christianity is natural in any way, right? We're not making that claim. I'm a little puzzled. I'm a little puzzled by your the way you formulated your question. What I'm arguing is is that. In many respects, comparatively speaking, religion as it exists in human cultures is, in the sense that I've defined, cognitively natural. I suspect there's no one in this room who would want to argue that Christianity does not qualify as an instance of a religion. Ergo, it follows, much about Christianity is cognitively natural. Okay, so we say much of any religion Islam, or Judaism, whatever it is, has elements of naturalism, but they themselves are not naturalism, right? If that makes sense. I mean, they have elements of folk religion or all the things that are natural, but they themselves have been developed like as science has been developed. Well, uh, yeah, I mean, again, I mean, what you're talking about is, is a set of conditions that arise in some cultures. Um, I mean, my friend. Uh, really, friend Frederick Barth, who spent that time among the Bakhtaman, you need to understand something about the Bakhtaman. When Frederick Barth showed up to the Bakhtaman, the Bakhtaman did not know that there were any human beings who existed except for the people who lived in the lands immediately contiguous to them. Among other things, they did not know. It's not that they were non-literate or illiterate. They did not know literacy existed. So among other things, Barth carefully hid his pencils and notebooks and pens. This was back in 1968. Um, that's one kind of set of cultural conditions that members of our species have lived in, including all of our ancestors, if we go far enough back, okay? Uh, there are other cultures. Uh, I mean, this is mostly about the invention of agriculture and the consolidation of populations and the rise of cities and things like that. You know, read Jared Diamond's Guns, Germs, and Steel, uh, the best book out there on this topic. Uh, and um, then you, and then that includes the invention of literacy. And as soon as you get literacy, you get an externalized object of your reflection. And that's a lasting object. Right? It's not fleeting like our thoughts are. It's not fleeting like our speech is. Now we've got an objective thing out here that's intersubjectively available. We can all read this text and look at it. And that leads to all kinds of new, exciting cultural developments. 
If you're asking me, does Islam and Judaism and Christianity and Hinduism and, as it were, the major world religions all involve that stuff? Sure, they do, because they all arose in literate cultures. Okay, uh, but is all the other stuff there as well? Yup. I mean, one of the games that's played, and I don't know if I, I don't, I honestly, I do not. Well, I'll just say what I got to say. Uh, I'm not, I trust everybody understands. I'm not out to offend anyone. But out there in the religious world, one of the games that's played is our religion is different. Everybody knows this. Our religion is the special one. Out there in the world of religious studies, there's a game played, right? And it's typically the great world religions. Well, one of the points about this project is that in certain fundamental regards, all religion is the same. Whether they like it or not. <coughs> okay, and on that, Bob, uh, thank you very much. <laughs> <laughs> but not in all respects.